Hey, welcome back. I'm Zed. Lately, with the launch of some medium format cameras like the Fuji GFX and the Hasselblad X1Ds, there has been a lot of talk about the three dimensional medium format look, which some people can see while others don't. And beyond the reasoning of shallow depth of field and smooth tonal gradation due to larger sensors and higher bit depth, there is one missing piece that is key to this signature look and why is it evident in film and only some medium format cameras. So stay tuned till the end because I'm going to show you how to replicate this look with a free action after I explain the concept. Firstly, the most important thing to remember is all medium format cameras are not the same. If an APS-C sized or cropped sensor of a digital SLR gives you this shallow depth of field with a 100mm lens at f2.8, then a full frame or a 35mm film will give you this angle of view with the same 100mm lens at f2.8 aperture. Now, a semi or a smaller medium format sensor like the new Hasselblad X1D and the Fuji GFX will give a slightly larger angle of view than the 35mm with a similar 100mm lens at f2.8. Then comes the full frame medium format camera sensors which is identical to the smallest medium format 645 film. And finally comes the 6x6cm Hasselblad square film format and the 6x7 Mamiya or Pentax film formats with the similar 100mm angle of view at f2.8 aperture. So the benefit of larger formats is that you can create a shallow depth of field with standard and even wide angle of view. But this is just one element that contributes to the medium format look. Besides, this claim of medium format cameras having shallower depth of field has already been debunked. So the claims have shifted to better dynamic range due to larger sensors and higher bit depth, but it doesn't play a major role in this medium format look. Now, what exactly is this so-called three-dimensional medium format look? So megapixels and sensor size aside, it's often easy to detect some medium format images even on the internet because of the way the transition between the in and out of focus area is rendered. It is almost three dimensional and this is accentuated further with shallow depth of field. And this is what the creamy or buttery smooth look and feel people refer to but can rarely pinpoint. Now what causes this special look in some medium format cameras? The answer has nothing to do with the physics. but the algorithm. So let's move away from cameras for a while. From this last video, you must remember that sharpening in digital images happens in three stages during capture, then creative sharpening which we saw in details, and a final output sharpening. Now capture sharpening partly depends on the quality of your lens and the focusing techniques you use. The other important and unnoticed part of capture sharpening is how your raw converter decodes the sharpness. And this is clearly evident when you compare the same exact RAW file in Lightroom and Capture One at default settings. They always look different, not only in sharpness but also colors, right? So why does this happen? This my friend happens due to the algorithm they use for something called deconvolution sharpening. It may sound like a fancy word but it is really simple. Let me explain. Deconvolution is a form of capture sharpening designed to offset the softness created by our lenses and anti-aliasing filters in the sensors of our cameras. So with some complicated algorithms, deconvolution sharpening can help restore much of that lost detail. So basically the raw softwares take the information from the raw file, fine tune them and put it back together. And since Capture One is primarily designed for Phase One digital backs and the focus software for the Hasselblad cameras, it seems that their algorithm takes in account the lens, aperture and the pixel pitch of the sensor. And then the sharpness is applied accordingly with different parameters to render a smooth transition between the in and out of focus areas. So when you put the larger sensor size and higher bit depth with this deconvolution rendering, the combined result is that medium format look and feel. And that is why it is only visible in some high-end medium format digital cameras. Now, to replicate deconvolution sharpening in Photoshop is possible by frequency separation. In fact, deconvolution is the reason frequency separation exists in Photoshop, which by the way will be covered in the next video, so stay tuned for that. And the link to this free medium format deconvolution action is down in the description below. So back in Photoshop, I have linked that same action to this B1 button on my Pro Workflow panel. And you can choose to do that if you have one, otherwise use it directly from the actions panel. So once you run the action, your image may look either sharp or smooth. Sometimes it looks just perfect. But if it doesn't, you can take control of the parameters via the smart filter. For the high pass filter, Try never to go above 1 pixel radius to avoid halos. 0.3 to 0.6 is usually a good range. 
You can also fine tune by adjusting the opacity of the details layer and the smoothness layer or of the entire group. The goal is to get the best possible in and out of focus transition. Take a look at the sharp areas. This is the before and the after. See how the sharpness stands out? And in the before, notice how uneven is the out of focus area around the jawline and the hair in the back? And this is the after. See how the unevenness melts away, making the out of focus area so creamy. This is because the clutter of the middle and lower frequencies have been softened a bit. And don't worry, I'll explain all about these frequencies in the frequency separation video next. So make sure not to miss that by subscribing and ringing the bell to be notified. So with the smoothness layer, remember to be very subtle with the opacity because too much of that will make your image look fake kind of smooth, which is not good of course. So always zoom out and check if your image is not over smooth and then reduce the opacity if it is. Now I'm not sure if you can see the subtle difference in a compressed YouTube video, but you can try the action yourself later. And it works pretty well with all clean DSLR images. But if your image has a lot of high ISO noise, then this action emphasizes the noise and won't work very well. So make sure you use it on a clean image. Now let's move on to this image and I'll show you how to use this action to get that authentic film look. So in the recent years, if you want the film look, the trend is to apply one of the film presets in Lightroom or Capture One, which is fine and they will get you the film colors. But if your workflow involves Photoshop, I would not recommend them, even though we sell them on our Epic website. And this is for two reasons. Firstly, because the mid frequency of the digital SLR images still look digital. And I'm not talking about the mid-tone contrast with faded blacks or highlights. The presets do all that. What I'm talking about is the mid-tone structure, if you will, which is rendered by some middle frequencies of the digital image. And secondly, simply because in Lightroom and Capture One, it is applied in the beginning of the workflow. If you use Photoshop, which I assume you do, then I always recommend color grading in the very end of the workflow just before sharpening. So imagine I've done the color correction and the retouching, and as a last step, I'll apply this action. And you can see the out of focus areas have become creamier and the sharpness is standing out. Now since I'm going for that film look, I have the liberty to boost the smoothness slider even higher and remove this weird distraction in the bokeh. And just like that the distractions are gone. This is possible because the low mid frequencies and the low frequencies blend a bit and our eyes will be pulled towards the focused or sharp areas of the image like her eyes and the sweater. And I know it looks a bit too smooth right now, but this has a purpose as I'm just creating a base for the final step for the film look. But before that, if you want to replicate film colors, which is not necessary, but since I mentioned earlier about my preferred workflow, I want to show you how I apply the film chrome LUTs, which are converted into profiles for camera raw in Photoshop instead of using them in Lightroom or Capture One as presets. This is the default profiles that come with the Pro Workflow X, and just below is the film chrome LUTs. And I have a few favorites, like the Fuji Astia, oh this black and white looks good in your pan across. Next is Fuji Pro which is a classic for great skin tones. Now let's see some Kodak before finalizing. Oh here are the Ilford black and whites. And this image looks nice in black and white. Anyway here comes the Kodak and I'm searching for Portra which is another classic as you all know. Here it is. This is the Portra 400. And this is the Fuji. I think I'll go with the Fuji. Now I can adjust the opacity of this LUT since it's installed as a profile. but. The best part is, I can fine tune the LUT further using the HSL sliders. Maybe darken the lips or adjust the skin luminance or hue and even saturation if I want. Also I could make last minute adjustments on highlights, texture or even clarity as a final touch to complement the color grade. But for this tutorial we just need a film color. So let's click OK. Now the final step which is very important to complete the film look is film grain. Now we're not just putting film grain for the sake of it. Film grain has a very important role in this. What this does is it fills the gap of the lower mid frequency that we smooth out with the action. This makes the film grain appear organic as it slightly floats over the plane of the image like you would see produced by a film emulsion. The film grain doesn't blend with the mid tones of the image. Let me turn off the film color to show you the before and after. See how crunchy the original image looks with noise? and how clean, crisp and authentic it looks after we filter out some of the lower mid frequency. In my opinion, this completes the film look. And if I turn it off, it looks like any other DSLR image with noise added. 
and you can replicate the same film grain even if you don't own the panel. So if you see, it is basically noise with some Gaussian blur and a bit of blend if to control the luminosity. And finally the layer is blended with a soft light blend mode. So you can use the same action with very subtle settings to simulate the medium format digital look or boost it up and add film grain to fill up the lower midtones and get the organic tonal structure of film. And the film profile is only required if you're after a particular film color. Here is the original digital image and this is the final film look with the Fuji Pro colors. And since we applied this LUT as a smart object, we can go back and change the intensity or even the film. And by the way, with black and white LUTs, we can't control the amount slider because it just starts showing the base color. So you have to keep it at 100. Anyway, I would love to hear your thoughts. This is just my approach and opinion about the film look based on personal observation over the years. But you are absolutely free to draw your own conclusions. Love it, hate it, try it out and let me know in the comments what you think. Again, the link for this action will be in the description below. And one last thing, the Style My Pick store is offering up to 50% discount on Master Retouchers Pack which includes the Pro Workflow Panel and the Palette Express LUTs, so do check it out. And make sure to stay tuned for the Frequency Separation video next week. Until then, thank you for watching.